1949, I saw the Life magazine and I wanted to be an artist. Of course, I lived in a rural area and in 49, that you, nobody becomes an artist. Was, that, was, that wasn't anything you've heard of. My first art piece was uh, typical of the St. Louis Artist Guild. It made the artist show out of about 800 entries and uh, 70, 70 pieces picked and I got into that show. Anyway, talk about materials and stuff. So, what I try to do is I try to use different materials because I get different effects with it. I also try to lay the paint down like Jackson did in order to get depth. First of all, I only lay one coat down at a time and let it dry. Jackson didn't do that. He laid three, four, five coats down and the paints would intermingle. Uh, I do one coat at a time and it just, I just keep building it until I find it comes out. And sometimes it'll set for a long time before I'll do anything else to it. And then it just seems like it, it finishes itself. I use powders. This happens to be an iron powder in an acrylic. That layer went on, and then I used a pneumonia, and I rusted it. So that's really rust. If you felt this, you'll see that the rust really comes off in your fingers. It is, it is iron on rust. Picture over there, I have copper. That is copper powder in uh, an acrylic base with the acetone, and the copper will break it up. I also have a square bucket with a stick in it. Like on that painting over there, all those lines are parallel, like little, little thin parallel lines. I put it in there, put it down with the stick. When I pull it out, the paint's on both sides of the stick, but pulls it out of the pen. I can then come down, take the paint, and I can put it in wherever I want small, small parallel lines. I can do it also three or four. I have sticks with three and four cuts in them. Uh, another thing that, that is controlling the paint, what, what, what I can do is if I hold the stick this way, I can control the thickness of the line by, by turning it, like so. Uh, I can also take it, clean out the center, hold it up high, and flip it. You know, put in a little bitty tiny dots, where I want the little dots to hit. So the idea is to play off the paint and to play off the movement of the paint in order to get your depth in what you're trying to achieve. Jackson Pollock spent about three months here in St. Louis as his travel as he traveled on up to New York and got hit in the, here in the Depression and uh, stay right out here in Hooverville. It was a tent city down here off of Broadway. He was down here for three months. He finally got out of St. Louis and got into New York. 1931, his brother Sandy came into New York. Brother Charles got him into the school with Thomas uh, Hart Benton, and he studied under Thomas Hart Benton. He also painted for the government. He got a, in the government work program as a WPA work program. So he really made his living during the Depression era it, through the government, painting uh, pictures, murals, and such uh, for the government building. He really liked aluminum paint. He didn't have the products that are available today, like the materials that we have available today, but he did a lot with aluminum paint. He got a lot of depth out of aluminum. Jackson always painted raw canvas on the ground. That looks like a raw canvas. The edge is raw canvas on this brown here, but that's not a raw canvas. That actually has a sealer on it. Uh, a lot of Jackson's paintings today are being restored because the, the paint and stuff is coming off the canvases because he didn't seal his canvases. Not that he didn't know that the canvases needed, needed to be sealed. He just didn't do it because he couldn't afford it. He was very poor. Anyway, he would paint on the floor raw canvases. And the reason he did is that his canvases were so big he couldn't, couldn't ship them. So he'd fold the canvases up. And he would send it, if he was going to take it to a, to a show, he'd take, bring in folded canvases. And he'd they'd build a stretcher right there and stretch the canvas right there on the floor and then put them up on the walls. It is the belief by several people that Pollock suffered from what was called optic migraines. If we get a migraine headache, it's very, very painful. An optic migraine uh, is of the optic nerves. And what it does to the brain is that if you look at something figuratively around the room, all you see is lines. All you see is broken up lines like this. It doesn't put, it doesn't put anything together. So a lot of times, Jackson would be painting in the air, and they believe that he was having an optic migraine and letting the paint fall, and he'd be painting the lines that he saw out in the air like such. The, the idea is, once a, once a painter or any artist starts to become known and people know of him, then they start to understand his art because they understand him. 
toward the end of Pollock's career, he had a pretty good run. Pollock was on to some new ideas, was trying some new stuff when he died. Worked a lot with black and white only uh, toward the end. He, some of his stuff was not considered by the, by the com art community, by the critics anymore, as being on target. There were new people coming up with new ideas. Now this, this stick here, got a kind of a curve and got a, a big hole right in here, which allows me to do a, a little bit different things with the paint. Uh, let me go ahead and put some white on here. That's my story in Jackson Pollock. Yeah. Yeah. There is a, um, I have a guest book over here on the table. Um, if you want to sign the guest book and put your email on there, keep it up to date. Uh, all the work that I do.